Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. I'm really excited because a few years ago I wrote an ebook on race, class, and parenting that was a product of some conversations that I had had with diverse groups of women over many years, and I am currently writing the second ebook on five strategies for talking about social injustice with your children. I have a great neighbor who is also a megastar social media influencer, and she invited me to come onto her platform to have a conversation about talking about race and racism with your kids and in social media forums. I've been in Dallas, Texas for the past few weeks. We decided to get away from quarantine in Los Angeles for a while. And you know what? It was kind of exciting to just even have something significant to get ready for because I've definitely been taking it easy with the kids, just kind of going fishing, taking walks, really, really just relaxing and enjoying my mom's cooking. So I got myself all ready today for this uh, conversation with Rachel that I think went really well. I'm happy to share it with you guys here. And back home in Los Angeles, my neighbor and close friend, Rachel Pitzel, was also getting herself set up and ready for the conversation. Hola. Hi guys. I'm just waiting um, for my co-host Mimi to join. Hi. As soon as she um, submits a request, I will have her join and then we'll start our conversation. Hi everyone. Hi. So sorry about the delay. We're just learning on how to do all this stuff. Ah. I hope everyone's having an okay day. Hi everyone. Hi, so nice to meet you all and connect and chat. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about my, about my co-host today. Um, Mimi Narti is an incredible resource. She's an author, she's a professor, she's a mom. Uh, she owns a company called Race, Class, and Parenting. Um, she's written, hi, she's written several books and she is writing another book um, right, that is coming out in the next um, week or so. Um, and it's just very topical information and so I wanted to be able to share because I personally would love to have more information about how to talk to my children about race and racism and the current social climate and um, and also just how to join the conversation because I feel like a lot of times when you put yourself out there this actually just happened to me um, when you put yourself out there a lot of times um, it's not always all right Mimi we're just waiting for her to join in Hi. Hey, girl. How are you? Good. Okay, so I just briefly introduced you, but you are an author. You're a mom of two children. Uh, you're a professor, and you're also the owner of Race Class and Parenting. So you've done these seminars and these amazing, um, just basically discussions about race, class, and parenting. Um, and just so you guys all know, we had actually started talking about doing a YouTube series earlier this year, late last year. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it all just kind of came up. And Mimi, I just, this is so topical. So I was sharing this exact conversation in a Facebook group. And a woman who's also a woman of color was like, why are you doing this? You're a white woman. Why are you sharing this? Blah, 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 blah. Are you just trying to like get views? Blah, blah, blah. And so I think wow. this is a, you know, I was really taken aback. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, let's, let's, why don't you introduce yourself and then we can get into, you know, chatting about a lot of stuff. Alrighty, so thanks so much for having me on your page and, you know, being willing to have this conversation. So, you know, I think that obviously people are just in all kinds of places along an emotional spectrum right now. So they're, you know, not maybe seeing the opportunities that are presented through having conversations like this and inviting so many people to the conversation. And as you mentioned, um, you know, I've been many things. I was, I was a professional athlete, and then after my career in soccer, I decided to go into academia, and I was a college professor for many years, and I just think that I gained a lot of experience facilitating conversation on topics that, you know, oftentimes can be difficult to grasp. I taught um, classes in environmental science, a lot of times they had a social science component, so I just started to realize like I was gaining skill and being able to create and maintain safe spaces for conversation. 
So yeah. I decided to see if I could kind of take my show on the road <laughs> at the university and see if I could kind of apply those same skill sets to help all of the amazing, dynamic, diverse women that I knew have important conversations that weren't being had. Like, I just felt like I was looking around me, you know, like I did a co-op preschool. I just have, my entire life I moved so many times. I lived in so many places in the United States. I traveled because of soccer. I've known so many great people. And I think people have great intentions, but not the support to parent to those intentions. 100%. And I think that's what I like value so much, like as a friend um, and neighbor, but um, just because we can have a lot of these conversations and they can be really difficult to have. Um, right. And so, you know, let's first, I think that one of the first things is you were talking a lot before we get into anything is intentions. So let's really get there into intentions. Yeah, I think it's really important, even as we're doing this, to kind of like set the stage and set the intention. Something that I realize is, you know, um, again, these are subjects that are highly emotional. When you're talking about like social identities, people have, you know, very significant and important sensitive histories related to uh, those identities. So it is important to just like, even for us to start this out and like kind of lay out what the intentions are. And for me, I see my leadership role in all of this as, like I said, maintaining safe space for effective communication and dialogue. I think that it is going to require the engagement of everybody yes. for us to have sustainable social change. That's you know how I've conceived these problems. This is how I see it. And I think that if we can't even talk to one another, if we can't invite each other to have conversation, then we aren't really going to be able to have sustainable progress. And I feel like that is something right now, because one of the things I said to you is as a white person, sometimes I feel like I'm walking on landmines and I want to be able to, you know, promote the cause and to be able to say that I stand behind you. But sometimes it feels like the minute you put yourself out there, a lot of people want to attack you, say you're doing things wrong, questioning your motivations, questioning why you're doing things. You know, and I think, you know, right now there's, you know, many trends on social media where it's like a blackout, you know, a photo yeah. or like, hey, I'm going to remember we were talking about this today. Like, I'm going to mute my voice. And for me, I was like, well, I am choosing not to say anything because I don't feel like it's the right time. But I almost feel like saying those things is almost promoting yourself. Mm -hmm. But then on the flip hand, people were questioning my motivations of doing this here. And I'm like, well, I, I just happen to know somebody who's a great speaker and we had already discussed that we have a lot of interesting things and we can have these conversations in a safe space. And that's what I want people to know is that every we need everybody's dialogue here. And so that is one thing that I would, you know, love your help on. Yeah, for sure. I think, it, you know, again, these are really important issues that you're bringing out. And, you know, not just with how you're going to communicate your uh, allyship or your interest or your advocacy on social media, but even starting at home and just the idea of you know, how are you gonna even begin to engage in this dialogue with your kids? These are two subjects that actually overlap. And, you know, like like you mentioned, I do have this book that I am sending to publication next week. I'm really excited about it. It's an ebook, so hopefully the turnaround will be really quick. But I already have one ebook out there and um, it is Race, Class and Parenting. And you can search it under that title or under my name, Mimi Narte. It's on Amazon, ebook, Kindle, download. The reason why and I'll, I'm- I'll share it here as a story after this conversation. For sure. The reason why I am um, encouraging people to go ahead and grab that first is because that book kind of works you through an exercise for you to figure out your why. I think that's really important. A lot of people, you know, again, when you feel like I'm not sure what I should say, if I should say something, you aren't sure how to behave or how to interact because you haven't really worked through for yourself why does this really matter for me? Why does this really matter for my kids? And I think that a lot of times we, you know, people who are ahead in life really develop a vision of themselves yeah. that they believe in. They develop a vision of their families that they believe in and they execute on that, but they don't really take it beyond that. They're not like thinking, okay, what is the vision of my community that I really believe in? What is the vision of my society, my country that I really believe in or my world? And I think the reason why I say believe is because believe is really strong. It's like a stronger world than uh, word than think. Like not what do I think the world should be like? What do I believe? When you know what you believe the world should be like, then it's going to motivate you to be active in terms of bringing that into fruition. So I think figuring out again, like I'm saying, why is it that you want to even have this conversation with your children? Why is it that you want to raise awareness? Then you'll be a little bit more confident in 
jumping into the conversation. Yes. Now, the second kind of consideration that I have with regard to the social media engagement is um, something that we all struggle with is just acknowledging that we have limitations. Right. Acknowledging that our understanding is limited. There are so many different ways that we have limitations, but I think often we kind of come into the conversation and not realize that even as we enter, we're making the space unsafe with our contribution because it is overzealous. It's overzealous. So, you know, again, we are trying to facilitate a dialogue. Your uh, conversation, your perspective is important. It matters. We want it to be heard but you have to kind of approach it with a kind of humility and an openness. And I think that a lot of times people aren't approaching it with the correct level of openness for it to even be received. I think, you know, I have done a lot of education. I have a couple of Ivy League degrees. I have a doctoral degree. All of these things, um, surprisingly, I feel like what really makes me smart though is like understanding how little I know. About right. Understanding and I think how we, all really need to understand that is we all have you know a very limited lens in what we view the world in you know and i think that is something that is so important to say you know and you've communicated with me so many times you know your narrative is very different you know as a black woman in the united states because you've had such different experiences than maybe so many other women right and so i think that can I just say, so one thing I feel like is really missing is just approaching things that we see online and in social media with kindness. And I, I very much understand that there's so much going on and things are so heated. And let's just say like, so I feel like there's so much stress and anxiety from COVID, from being yes. home, from the unknown, from, you know, teaching our children, from all of these things behind. Right. But I think if we can approach things with a more open heart, right? Um, because the thing I feel like has made us successful is that we approach things knowing that we're friends right. and knowing that we're trying to understand each other. Right. Well, and you know, something about me and the reason why... Oh, sorry, one second. Somebody just said her narrative as a Mexican woman is so different too. And that's true with Mexican yes. women all over the country. You're yes. going to have a different narrative. I, well, it's funny because the very first strategy in the forthcoming book, the forthcoming book is five strategies for discussing social injustice with your kids. The very first and most important strategy is to kind of do an assessment and see where you are. And the critical question there is, do you and your children already own multiple narratives of the minority group's experience? So for example, the black experience, do you and your children already own multiple narratives? You know, there's a great uh, a TED talk about the danger of a single story. And the problem is you don't want to introduce these conversations to your children with like, once upon a time, there was a person who was black who was murdered in the street, you know, kind of thing. Like it's right. just overwhelming and it's also dehumanizing. What we need is to have multiple narratives and experiences for our children that are authentic so they have context to be able to um, you know, process that injustice as is developmentally appropriate. And I think one thing that you've done, like, so for Harper's birthday one year, you gave her a Barbie doll and you knew we were going to Kenya. And so yes. you gave her like a black Barbie doll, you know? I and thought so it looked like me, actually. It did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, one thing I think is really interesting today is that many of the surprise dolls, you don't know what you're gonna get. And so it is kind of fun that I do feel like more children are being exposed to that. You know, um, but that is just something to keep in mind is when you're when you're buying toys and when you're telling stories, like one of the things we've been doing with our kids is telling different stories of fairy tales from around the world yes. and how they look different, you know? And I think right. that's an important thing and that's an easy that's an easy way to start. I think 100%. So here's the thing, again, kind of coming from a public health background, making it a little bit nerdy for a second. There's this concept, a moderator is something that helps a, an external physical event take on an internal psychological significance, okay? So when you have, you know, some sort of information that you're trying to get your child to process, the mediating variable is the context that that child already has. So it's like, oh. I want to talk about social injustice with my child and I want them to understand some concepts. The really important thing that needs to be there is already the context and the appreciation and the respect for people from that community first. Otherwise, it's not going to be authentic. And you know, one of my race class and parenting sessions we did on parenting special needs children. And at the conclusion of that, one of the women came to me and said, thank you so much for doing this. I learned so much. I've always told my children to be kind 
to kids who have special needs, but it's never been authentic until today because there's no authenticity without that context. Right. That's so interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. So what do you, do you have any strategies for people who may be in like more like rural communities or communities where they're, you're not going to see as many different like people of color? Let's just right. use that as an example. I, well, you know, what's really funny, Rachel, when I was in elementary school, I lived in rural Illinois and I was the only black child in the entire school district, <laughs> but I made incredible friends and I actually found people that were very open-minded, kind-hearted. I have such, you know, lasting friendships from, right. from there. I think that, you know, it's, it is a little bit tough if you're not in an urban area and you don't have ready access. Yes. But those, um, the exposures to those narratives can be both real and even imagined. Okay. okay. So I think that when it comes to, especially with your children, just being able to have storybooks where the protagonist is a child of color, you know, children that are Latino, children that are Asian, children that are African American, it doesn't even necessarily have to be um, a true story. Got it. In order for it to start to contribute to the idea that there are many different black experiences, many different Asian experiences, to the point that the viewer made many different Mexican American experiences, you know, so, this is what we need to, um, you know, be resourceful and be creative and how, especially for children, we would start to, uh, you know, enhance their perspective. Yeah, and their understanding. Okay, so then what would be the next step there? Um, so, yes, so many different uh, uh, things, but like I said, I think going back to this idea of acknowledging where our limitations are, acknowledging where our limitations are and understanding kind of I think something that I had thrown out to you is that you know really talking about race um, you know to some extent within your home with your kids but especially in a broader social context it's not a 100 level course okay yeah <laughs> right? the United States is not a 100 level course it is quite a bit complicated and so um, there are kind of prerequisites that we would need to take before we would be able to effectively engage and communicate in those conversations. And I think it's on us to decide again, why is this important to me and what am I willing to do? Um, you know, what am I willing to learn? And seeking out kind of mentorship, seeking out mentorship. And it, you know, it behooves people from the minority group to also be willing to um, support friends in that process or in that journey of you know, greater discovery and greater understanding and greater empathy, you know, it's it's an exchange all the way around. And so one quick thing there, um, I feel like a lot of like people of color, especially women of color right now are being called upon so much by their white friends and like other, we'll just say other, by other yeah. people to, to ask for resources, to explain things. But I also feel like many people of color are tired and they're hurting i mean we already have like we said covid we have the stress we have the anxiety and we have not just george floyd we have you know ahmad we have all these other situations and then we also have years of things going on and systemic stuff so can you maybe give us some like just general strategies like obviously you know like i have you and i have other people right. but just just maybe some other people who don't have that because i also don't want to overwhelm like women of color and people of right. color because i have seen many messages like i'm overwhelmed you know like right. what are some other strategies that we can do like maybe do you want to create like some resources for people you know yeah. and i can try to do that you know and gather some from you but what are some other ways that we can do that without overwhelming women who may already be really emotionally tired well, I think that like it's kind of important, a little bit of the nuance of the language of what I said. I think that really what it comes down to is looking for, you know, obviously you have to be sensitive to timing. You know, obviously you have to be, and as people are grieving or as people have experienced some sort of recent trauma, it's not the time to kind of ask, you know, oversimplified questions necessarily. Everybody knows the strength of the relationships they have with their own friends. Yes. But I, like I said, I'm talking about a mentorship okay dynamic where it's not like you know i don't call my professional mentors for every single basic simple question right i need to do my own research you know right like you go into an internship i need to do my own research and i need to come ready and prepared right. when i am ready and prepared and i reach a point where i am still kind of lacking understanding or you know I'm then ready, you go then that would be the appropriate time to say hey you know i've been looking into this and i you know 
just that demonstration of your own effort on your own accord. It's not someone else's responsibility for me to be able to learn. Yes. But I would love when necessary to get support or to get advice or to get, you know, clear understanding yes. on certain topics. Yes. Uh, somebody just asked where I'm from. I live in Los Angeles. Mimi also lives in Los Angeles. She's uh, visiting family right now in Dallas, but we both I live am in Texas right now. I'm a total Te Texan. Right now, but, pull uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, so and just what you were saying, I think that's just a great advice in general as life, and that's something I'm really working on with my children as I'm homeschooling. Is one of the biggest things I've noticed, and I think a big criticism of millennials as a whole, and I think this more hits older millennials, is expect like when you have a run into an issue, is always going and saying, How do I do this instead of right. problem solving? So, I think just as a general rule. Um, to say, okay, do some research. You know, obviously Google can lead you down different pathways, but spend some time, do some different things, and then go, you know? And, and I feel like that's often when you and I have those conversations is, you know, when we get there, or, you know, it just gotta happen. It just, yeah, exactly, exactly. I think that that's just, again, kind of like a good rule of thumb, a good way to play it. Yeah. Um, treat it as you would other things, you know, you wouldn't really, it, w it would not be respectful of someone else's time to go in completely underprepared and expect, like you're saying, just them to explain everything to you, the information that's readily available. Right. Okay, so next strategy. So now we're on uh, number three for, um, for kids and just for parents and how you're kind of going into this. Yeah, so I think another really um, important strategy when it comes to talking about this is to really kind of connect it to other kinds of common histories because my real big right. concern about this is really kind of dehumanizing people accidentally. So when you, like, that's what I'm saying, like without other kinds of narratives about the black experience, if I only tell you stories about black people that involve struggle or oppression, that's not really relatable because that's not a full um, picture of a human experience. Right. So, and I think that even when you look at the entire history of that racial group, it's important and necessary and meaningful to be able to connect it to other kinds of histories and narratives, you know, because there have been other communities that have experienced suffering. And so 100%. it's um, a humanizing approach. And I think that that is what is so meaningful because what, what we just did with the Cinderella stories or with like even at the story of Noah, if you look, there's like 40 different cultures who all share this common story right. and tale. And so I think it's just a way of weaving humanity, you know, together and saying we're all humans. Yes. And like you said, I think you have a couple of reasons and I totally get why you're saying that, but I do think it makes it from something that's almost amorphous to making it right. real making absolutely making it real and to the extent that you have connections in your own family history you know i lean on those when it came time you know it's funny not just um even theoretical connections but real personal experiences i was uh telling i tell my children all the time i had a really close friend when i was five years old who was jewish and it's really funny because she had brought some matzo to school for snack yeah and <laughs> You know, I, you know, sit down for snack time and I'm like, hey, what's that? You're like, can I get a, can I get a taste, basically? <laughs> and she's like, you know, she looks at me and she's like, well, this is for people who are Jewish. And then she kind of gets serious and she's like, are you Jewish? Which is really funny because <laughs> obviously we're five-year-old kids and I had never thought about it. Nobody had ever asked me if I was Jewish before. So all I could do was like deductive reasoning. Right. Say, well, like, look, you're Jewish, you're my best friend, I must be Jewish. Yeah. She's like, You're right. <laughs> and she broke off some of her matzo for me and we snacked the town down. And you know, that's like one kind of funny story that's part of my personal narrative, my relationship with her. I have other great stories. When I was in graduate school in New York, I nannied for two really awesome Jewish families. And I had great adventures with these kids. I took yeah. them as my own. They were about the age of my own little sister at the time. And it's important that I share these stories with my children because, again, these are my personal stories that give humanizing context but that I think is important before we start talking about the Holocaust, for example. Right. Yes. You, 100%. You understand what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, um, you know, these are real people that have significant significance, even in my mom's own life. Like, there are many things that I learned, like many, like, opportunities that I had, things that I appreciate, fond memories things that I feel like were inflection points in my own personal development that came from different kinds of communities, people from different kinds of communities. And I want my children to have that as a safe foundation 
um, and their own experiences as a SAFE Foundation before we start talking about, you know, these oh, things. So, yes. So, like I said, you want to really make that context, the personal context, but also like those historical, draw those historical commonalities. So right. We'll see, because otherwise you will also inadvertently impose a social hierarchy. On my YouTube channel, I talk about, you know, why I'm really concerned about Black History Month. Yes. I think these are really small children. I think that the context is not fully built out for them. And I think that it might be a point source for systemic racism in America. Well, and you and I have had this conversation right. because after when Grayson was in kindergarten and after he yes. had a conversation in class about about Black History Month, we are crossing the street and I don't know, you know, I remember the first time I realized that people were different races was around right. second grade when the Berlin Wall fell. Yes. And I remember, right, and because I told you this, we were crossing the street and he goes, oh, look, that's a black person. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was like we don't say that. I exactly. like, no point. But I think it became that sometimes you have to say it at the right time and in the right way. So let's talk a little bit about how we talk to younger children right. about what's going on. Um, I think this is, yeah, this is really important. I know a lot of people are thinking, or the question has come up, like, are my children too young to talk about racial injustice? There is really no age where it's too young to begin to address this because research shows that as young as six months children are already beginning to develop tolerance or intolerance wow. because they are recognizing even the um, variety of facial features that they're exposed to in skin color so babies who see a more diverse range of of faces are actually more tolerant as their you know neuro connections are being wow that makes so much sense though right right so so really there's that kind of experience that they're having in terms of exposure. And frankly, in our society, we live in a biased society. So inequity right. is the status quo. So your children are being socialized. You cannot be passive about this at any age. Even if you're just watching, you know, cartoons on television, what is the diversity level of the cartoons? What is implicitly being said to your children right. about the way that society is complied or what society should be like. So this is something that at every age, because they are being taught, if you're not teaching them, they are still being taught. Right, and they're they're, they're drawing they're a lot of their own assumptions. Exactly. Yeah, so right. I do think that there is, you know, no age where this is a conversation that is completely off limits or out of bounds. Now, we still have to appreciate respect and be sensitive to the developmental age. <laughs> Right. of each child and we're not trying to traumatize children and so I do think that you know oversharing especially recently we've seen some very violent acts it's right. not appropriate for children to be like engaged on a full level well and people. my concern is when when some of these things obviously the news loves to like you know like dramatize things. right and so the the vision of the angry black man and the right. like that you know that stereotype like how, what do we do to to talk about this narrative with our children so they don't have that in their in their mind yeah i think you really have to just fundamentally limit the exposure and that actually okay. i believe that across all races like i don't think that it's an empowering image necessarily for my children who are black they are too young to be exposed to like the full breadth of this uh, for my daughter who's in middle school and even for my son we've had a conversation about what's going on but i would never have them actually physically watch <laughs> Yes. what happened because it's just not appropriate the same way that i wouldn't take them to a rated r film right this is a rated r kind of scenario so you have to really be able to modify if i go and see you know a rated r film i can kind of tell you know what's funny i watched tiger king yes you know, so just so you appreciate <laughs> just so you know everybody there's so tiger king in the news like today has the devices I watched yes. the Tiger King. Wait, wait, but real quick, did you know Carol Baskin got um she now? I just getting... heard that. Yes. Oh my goodness. Okay. Carol so Baskin's that's, that's always that's taken over. So I watched Tiger King and it was obviously not something that's like developmentally appropriate for my eleven year old, but it's such a fascinating, wild story that I shared with her about what I had watched. I gave her the clip notes about what I had seen. Right? Yes. And so that's where, you know, I translated to her or I, you know, kind of did some sort of modification in the story to what is her 
developmental level so that she could, you know, take the lessons, be fascinated and entertained by the story that I was fascinated and yes. by. Yes. Yes. I think that what we need to do in this situation is the same thing is that we need to figure out what are the important points that are sticking points that are that matter. Um, and how is it that we are going to be able to articulate that in a developmentally appropriate way, you know, with my Yes. Yes. And so can you just that, give us like, because yeah, I, I think, will... yeah, would, so like, let's just say we're talking, so Mimi and I both have second grade boys. Um, so they're like that seven, eight, nine, eight range. So how would we facilitate that conversation? Because obviously like they're more conscious of what's going on. They don't get it. They're not seeing right. all of it. But so how are we going to kind of start that conversation with them? Well, what's funny for me with Lincoln, the way that I ended up uh, starting the conversation was I told him the facts of the situation um, okay. without um, focusing on the race of the people initially. For this uh, conversation in particular, what I'm saying is I introduced the ideas of, of what happened in this situation with George Floyd, but I did not emphasize the race of the two people that were involved initially. So, okay. because, so, and I think that that again is my interest is being able to begin to introduce the idea of injustice, right? But not, but in a way that's still empowering to my black son. You know, right. so, so I want to be careful about how it is. I don't want him to feel um, like excessive uh, vulnerability or risk. You right. know what I mean? I want there to be perspective. So it's like, first, I want to explain that, you know, people were upset and people were hurt because this tragedy occurred because right. somebody's life was lost because it was done in an unfair way because there wasn't accountability. And right. so we kind of have that conversation initially and let that marinate and let him ask questions about that first. Okay. So that we can have that conversation first. Yes. Then the next time that we engage on the conversation, I can provide greater details and explain that like, oh, and you know, people had additional concern because this, and because, you know, there is this history that we have of racism and oppression for, you know, people don't like other kinds of people. And again, still couching in, and this is not a, an experience that's necessarily unique to you. Right. My child is very aware of, you know, things that have happened in other kinds of societies and other points in history and other settings. Right. So I, my interest is really making sure to, again, protect his sense of self while helping him to be aware. And as a mom of a black boy, so yes. what are some strategies to do that? Because you, you mentioned protecting a sense of self and obviously you don't want him to grow up with all of these things in front of him necessarily. I mean, he's, he's so young. Right. And so I will say, you know, there are differences in my experience from what would be kind of thought of as the stereotypical or mainstream African-American experience. Right. And one of those that's really important is just that my children have a lot of access to a wide variety of African-American people. Obviously, I'm, you know, I'm black yeah. and, and it's not just that, you know. Well, and can we just say also African people too, which is really yes. nice African, that you have. My yeah. dad is from West Africa. Uh, my mother is originally from Mississippi. So we have, you know, literally family all over the world. We have close family and close friends that really represent pretty much every single level of the socioeconomic strata. Right. So my children could probably not be more exposed to the multitude of black narratives. Right. So it also creates, um, you know, he has an excellent sense of self and sense of possibility that isn't necessarily shaken fundamentally because of that broad range of exposure. Of course, there are things that are going to be hurtful and things that are going to be concerning and things that are going, you know, but fundamentally it's not a, a you know, despair. Right. And I have to say that I feel like in my role as a mom and in my role as an education and thought leader on this, I am ruthlessly optimistic. Like that's what I would, I, 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 I mean, because, you know, you know how I am. I'm just a positive. Ruthless. Yes ruthlessly optimistic because that visionary leadership has to be ruthlessly optimistic and right. i think that comes from my experience playing sports every athlete learns the skill of optimism you have to come back from injuries you have to come back from being behind even if you're ahead you need cautious optimism to win the game so right. i and playing 
to the professional level, you know, I had a chance to play in the Women's World Cup. I have been well developed in that skill of optimism. And right. so I really am able to lean into that. And every narrative that I frame, this is also one of the strategies for my children, has to be rooted in that optimism. That is my responsibility as a mother, is to help protect their sense of hope. So one of the things I think is happening right now in many communities is there isn't that sense of hope, you know, and right. I think an important thing to point out because you're, you've written so much about race, class and parenting is this class part. Right. Um, and also just, and I think this is an important thing is just to talk about some of this optimism and just some of the opportunities that are lacking, some of the education that are lacking, some of these other things. and. And I think that's a really great way that like people like you and I and like other people can talk about because those are things that many of us do have access to, you know, and those are things that like I can fundamentally understand right. and I can easily advocate for. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I think that's, again, that's what's important as we have a conversation and as more and more is kind of revealed and discussed then it invites other people to be able to see where they can enter the dialogue, where they can enter the conversation and where they can find their advocacy. So as a white person, uh, I, you know, I think we started this out and just kind of saying, I feel like it's kind of like walking on landmines and like, as I stated, you know, I asked somebody like, hey, can I post this? And then somebody was like, hey, I need some resources about this. And I like, had, you know, mentioned what we're doing today. And then, you know, she was just kind of questioning different things. And I feel like right now it's so hard because there's, there's a lot of distrust. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of, you know, coming to this anxiety and fear. But I also want people to be able to support this and be an ally. So right. what are your, what's your advice for that? Yeah, like I'm saying, I just think that um, you're going to have to figure out why is it that you want to participate? Why is it that you want to be an ally? And that is not as simple as it seems. Like you actually need to take time. And as I shared before, in the first book, I kind of have exercises for you to do, things to write out. It's kind of like a journaling process for you to figure out why does this really matter to you? Once you know why, I think it really comes down to acknowledging your uh, limitations as you decide to kind of make yourself vulnerable and come into the conversation. Great, I love that. I really, really love that. It's beautiful. Um, okay, any last pieces, other things that, I mean, there's, Mimi and I can talk about this forever. We didn't want to make this too, too long today. That's already got over 30 minutes. Um, um, yeah. Definitely didn't want to make it too long, but I just think, like I said, it's just really important. I think that obviously, you know, again, we have been through a lot of trauma as a nation recently. And to your point, like even coronavirus, you know, coming from a public health perspective, um, that was enough to kind of like, you know, for I thought that was plenty for us to deal with and recover from for the whole year of 2020. But like, oh, yes. every yes. morning 100%. I wake up, I saw, I saw a meme today that was like, I'm just out here trying to figure out what chapter of Revelations we're gonna do today. I'm like, cause that's how it feels. It's like every day is, you know, something else, something new. Um, and yes. This has been just flooring, just flooring. In the context we were already struggling with global human health to have, you know, an incident like this that's just so hurtful. It's overwhelming where right. people were already kind of like, very fragile very very, very. and i think that's an important thing to talk about too you know maybe we can follow up this you know i definitely want to talk about things like privilege bias some of these other things we can do that and if you guys want to either reach out to mimi she's mom on the chart i'll um link her i'll link her book um and then some other resources um but i would love to one continue this conversation but i just want to acknowledge that we're all in coming from a difficult place i mean i don't know anybody who hasn't been hard hit you know who hasn't suffering you know in in several different ways and so this it is a lot and i think we also need to have some of those conversations too and just acknowledge that and i think that's something where you know it's hard because we want to like be gentle with each other and be kind you know and i think sometimes on social media especially in places like facebook you know it's so easy to jump to different things you know and so sometimes we just want to stand back and not say anything but then is that helping you know and right. and 
Yeah, it's a lot. Well, thank you, Mimi. You are just such an amazing resource. I'm so happy to have you as my friend and as my neighbor. Um, as soon as her book is out, you guys, I will be sharing this with everyone. I'll share her other book. Um, it's $3.99 on Kindle. Um, so I'll send that link, which is yeah. totally like accessible, accessible and affordable. For everybody. It's like, you know, trying to put it at a price point where everybody would have access to it. And I just want to like, just say thank you again, because, you know, it also requires a level of vulnerability for you to want to host this conversation on your page. And I think that everybody can respect that and, you know, really admire that. And I hope that you see yourself as a leader in the situation just for that, for that alone. And, you know, again, um, I'm hoping that this will be an example for many people of the nature or the opportunities that we have, the possibilities that exist to be able to have constructive dialogue uh, because yes. it's it's necessary if we're going to have sustainable change 100 percent, and i think that we all have that goal in mind of coming together and moving the conversation forward and and actually you know because i feel like we, we come back here the pendulum keeps coming back here you know and and you know we had i lived through rodney king here in la and there were other times that this has happened but we need to actually come together and make real change and i think honestly like you know you and i've had this conversation too but i believe our children are so much a part of this future you know be, oh, yeah. one they watch youtube videos of people speaking oh, yeah. other languages and just they're like right. oh, great. Yeah. but i also really truly think that that change so much of this change is going to come from our children and so i do yeah. really want to get them involved and in, and do that and you know what rachel parenting is our greatest activism at the I end of that. the day. I love that. Um, okay. 100%. So people are asking same time next week. So let's plan on doing this the same time next week. Please message yes. Mimi and I. We will cover whatever topics you guys want to talk about. I'm down for all of it, any of it. Um, and if there's any specific things that happen in that period of time, please let us know.